Good morning, uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are right now. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be the chair of this session. So we are going to talk about the COVID-19 and stroke. What are the pressing challenges? Uh, we have a great panelists here. So we will start with Dr. Alessandro Padovani from the University of Brescia in Italy. Dr. Cristiane Bressani from the Fiocruz Pernambuco, Brazil, and Dr. Lucia Brito from the uh, Ministry of Health of Brazil. Uh, before we could start with the session, I would like to uh, read some uh, housekeeping rules. So please, next slide. So this workshop is being recorded and will be shared on the Global Health Network Forum. Participants, videos, and microphones have been disabled, so please keep disabled. Please use the uh, Q&A box to introduce yourself and to post your comments and questions. If you would like to ask your question in person to one of our panel members, please click raise your hand in the toolbar and we will, will unmute you. So uh, thank you everybody for the attendance of this session and it will be a great uh, afternoon, night, so it depends where you are now. To start with, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Alessandro Padovani. Professor Padovani is a full professor in neurology at the University of Brescia in Italy, director of the neurology unit Department of Medical and Experimental Science, Director of the School of Neurology, and the National Coordinator for Medical Science and ANVUR, so the National Agency for the Evaluation of Academic Research in Italy. So thank you very much, Professor Padovani, and uh, have a great session. Oh, first of all, thank you, Felipe, for the nice presentation. It is really a pleasure and it is really an honor to be here and um, well, to share with you uh, some of the data that we collected, some of the experience that we have had in, the, in these last uh, months uh, and to share with you uh, eventually solution for most of the challenges. So I'm going to share my slides. Uh, and uh, I think everybody can see it. OK. Perfect. Um, so the title uh, uh, of my presentation uh, is to give you a panorama of the problem. We would need a lot of time, but I tried to summarize uh, briefly some of uh, the major issue that we faced uh, dealing with stroke patient during the first outbreak. During the first outbreak, Italy, as you know, was one of the first European country that after China had to tackle and, uh, and fight against the virus. And uh, up to now, uh, we uh, had a lot of uh, death, and, but we organized. Most of the contagious uh, people were in north of Italy, and Brescia and Bergamo were the most heated places uh, in uh, town that uh, had to do with uh, COVID-19. Now, let me uh, start with the description of a patient in order to get you into some of the problems. Uh, there are problems with COVID-19 patient. There are problems with uh, patients who do not suffer COVID-19. And as the Ministry of Health, uh, uh, Lucia will eventually know, there are a lot of things uh, that need to be in some way taken into account when we deal with uh, emergency and acute neurology patient. Now, this patient is quite young, 64 years old, male, 
He was independent. Actually, he was vice major of the little town uh, in the surrounding of uh, Lombardia and Brescia. His past medical history was remarkable. Only a, a, a light, a mild diabetes uh, in the last three years. Now, he got uh, COVID-19 in a sort of a mild form uh, several weeks before he came to the clinic. He had a high temperature and diarrhea, so a very anomalous presentation for COVID-19, uh, very, very small problems and not respiratory problems. Now, after several weeks, so from March to May 4, he started to show progressive psychomotor slowing down. And after very soon, on May 17, he came to the emergency room because he complained of right arm and leg weakness. So this is the story. So it's a, it's a clear, typical post-COVID syndrome uh, affecting uh, with a, a, a typical stroke-related uh, symptomatology. So the neurological examination is, uh, was characterized by disorientation to place and time. Speech and thought process was, were, were very slow. And uh, he had and he showed impaired facial muscle strength on the left side and uh, a left arm and leg weakness. So the presentation sounded very clearly referring to an ischemic stroke. Father he had headache. Actually, headache was, uh, was a sort of a prodromal uh, symptoms the patient was concerned of in a few weeks before the onset of the paresis. Now, this was his MRI. So he developed multilobar brain hemorrhage. And as you can see, this was huge and progressive. And at the time we performed an MRI, he was comatose. So in, during four, 24 hours, he developed more than five different focal hemorrhage. And these are the dimension, the size of the hemorrhage. Now, we had a lot of problem understanding what was the relationship with COVID-19. And actually, uh, from May through June, uh, different papers uh, and observation came into the literature. And we understood that, in fact, this multilobar hemorrhage is a serious complication uh, of COVID. And it might follow COVID-19 infection after several weeks. As you, as you will see in, in some of the next slides, uh, is not uncommon to develop a neurological syndrome after a while, even months after the first uh, infection. And there are different hypotheses has to do with direct and indirect endothelial toxicity on one side, has to do with the inflammatory cytokine production or activation of coagulation cascade. But there is another uh, hypothesis that has to do with the renin angiotensin system. A disruption of the system might, in fact, leading to cerebral blood flow, this autoregulation that might bring to uh, hemorrhage. Now, when we talk about COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, we have to uh, recognize that there are different stages. Each of these stage might be related, might be uh, determined a neurological complication. We have neurological complication in uh, age or elderly, even with mild constitutional symptoms or very small fever. Uh, and this is something that we have to take into account actually one of the first patients that we had to uh, treat in, in, in our uh, neurological unit was a guy that complained of uh, confusion and delirium. Uh, and it turned out to be COVID-19 positive after three or four days. This is another problem that we face at the beginning of the outer outbreak. Uh, to recognize patients with 
typical neurological onset that actually had to be consequent from a COVID-19 and how to manage a patient that turned out to be COVID-19 afterwards, uh, the onset of neurological symptoms. Now we have a stage where pulmo the pulmonary phase uh, brings, uh, uh, determine uh, hypoxia, shortness of breath. And in this uh, situation, there is uh, an increase uh, of inflammation that might eventually uh, get worse and worse uh, and be uh, responsible of RDS uh, or shock or cardiac failure. So each of these uh, stages uh, might be related to some neurological different pictures and uh, uh, symptoms. Now, um, there are some evidence, I'm not very convinced, but there are some evidence that some neurological uh, consequence uh, might be dependent on a direct infection injury. It could be, but we didn't observe any patient since the beginning of this story. Uh, there are obviously some relationship with hypoxic injury, immune injury, and hypercoagulability, and all of them might determine an infectious toxic encephalopathy, a viral encephalitis, and acute cerebrovascular disease. Actually, there are some interesting findings uh, connecting uh, a sort of a vasculitis to cerebrovascular disease immune-mediated vasculitis. There are some evidence, in fact, that in COVID-19 patients, some uh, antibodies, of, uh, anti phospholipids antibodies develop uh, that interact with beta-2 glycoprotein. Uh, and uh, the, the development of these antibodies might, in fact, in some way determine an impairment of the anticoagulant reaction even determines some cell-mediated events like vascular injury, platelet activation, dysregulation of eicosanoids, an enhanced endothelial cell procoagulant activity, and some neural events. And all this might be the trigger of a thrombotic state. And the thrombotic states at the end might be the they say the basic uh, or the real mechanism for increasing the risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular accident. As we pointed out in this review that I wrote with Alessandro Pizzini about the neurological diseases that we observe at that time in patients with COVID-19, we made the, uh, the observation that the pulmonary systemic disease is linked to hyperinflammation and to multi-organ failure, as well as to an hypercoagulative state. Now, all of them might be responsible each for different state and different neurological syndrome, encephalitis, encephalopathy, and stroke. When we talk about stroke, we have to take into account that stroke may in fact, be determined by a disruption of the coagulation system and process. But on the other side, as I show you with a guy with multilobe or hemorrhage, we might have a different mechanism that goes through an immunomediated mechanism that determine or uh, provoke a vasculitis. And we might have stroke because of vasculitis. Uh, definitely, there are many other neurological symptoms and signs that might, or disease that might uh, follow a COVID-19. Stroke. Stroke has been reported among the most frequent neurological features of coronavirus viremia. It, it, some reports has a, a stress out and show that it might complicate up to 3% of COVID-19 patients. Uh, other studies uh, uh, with other uh, epidemia like uh, H1N1 or H1N5 have suggested that the bacteria or the viral infection might be a trigger for acute ischemic stroke, likely related to prothrombotic effect, as I show you, of the inflammatory response. 
Now, uh, talking about COVID-19, uh, the first uh, evidence uh, of uh, connecting stroke with COVID came from the paper of Mao from Wuhan. He claimed that uh, uh, up to 6%, almost 6% of severe patients suffer a stroke. Uh, another paper came uh, immediately later on by Lee. Uh, they found that uh, stroke was uh, uh, developed in uh, 60 or 6 percent of the, the sample uh, that they collected. So number are more or less very similar, 6 percent and 6 percent. But at the time we wrote the review, uh, we made a, a different observation and collecting. Uh, there were different papers with different number and all this number have been collected in different settings. So it's really hard to put things together. And uh, this is our series at that, at that time, but all these patients were collected from a neurological world dedicated to COVID. So we established a narrow COVID unit and not surprisingly, we had a huge number of stroke patients among the series of patients that we follow. Anyway, uh, there are different numbers. Uh, one of the most reliable uh, study was the, the one from Romero Sanchez, and he claimed and reported that, that the number of uh, uh, complicated stroke in COVID-19 patients was half of what was reported by Mao and Lee, almost 3%. And I, I have the feeling that the numbers uh, are more or less uh, uh, correct. Now, when we talk about stroke, uh, you understand that stroke can, 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 be, uh, or represent, can be referred to many different situations and many different neurological findings. Um, if you, this is a series from Gilela, and uh, the series, uh, uh, let you show how uh, heterogeneous is the neurological and neuroradiological features of people with cerebrovascular disease. So we have patients with very teeny lacunar infarcts, but we might have also patients with large vessel and large infarct size affecting one hemisphere or affecting many hemispheres, like uh, an, an even subtentorial region like the cerebellar. Uh, region. So uh, these are multi-lacunar uh, white matter lesions. So this is a, a, a huge lesion in the middle cerebral artery territories. This is a huge lesion in the anterior cerebral territory. So the, 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 the picture that came out, that stroke can be very heterogeneous also in COVID-19 patients. Now, the first question that came is uh, whether stroke actually is related in, in some way to SARS-CoV-2 beyond the biological mechanism, beyond the inflammatory uh, reaction. What makes stroke be related to SARS-CoV-2 and, and where are the findings and evidence? Now, I have to go back to our experience. The first Italian case uh, was uh, identified on February 21st. Now, uh, after a week, uh, uh, we started to see in Italy a progressive uh, uh, increase uh, of number of uh, subjects. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the blue line show you what was our medium admittance of neurological patient in, in, in the clean world. Uh, at that time, 8th of March, uh, we start to have the lockdown. So it, it took more or less two weeks to convince the politician that we need to uh, slow down and lock down at least Lombardy. And Lombardy was one of the first regions that uh, went through the lockdown. Now, the lockdown didn't change a lot of things. As you can see here, we face a, a progressive increase of neurological patients affected by COVID and we, reach our climax uh, around uh, the third week of March. And this was the huge increased number of patients that we have to take uh, care of. So that the normal um, average number of neurological patients and the huge number 
of neurological patients due to COVID. So COVID, in fact, was related to the increased risk of developing stroke. And uh, uh, obviously, we don't know exactly how many contagious subjects were outside, but this was what uh, we observed. Now, when we uh, counted all the patients from 20, uh, February 21st uh, up to April 31st, so along this interval period, we collected all together 500 neurological patients at the emergency room. And as I can see here, 30% of them were in fact COVID positive. So this number was our normal typical number of patients, but we had an excess of uh, neurological patient due to uh, COVID positive. And you can uh, compare uh, the numbers and the percentage of subjects uh, affected by COVID. So we have an, a, small, a small increase of stroke uh, patient and intracerebral hemorrhage, but the, the great number were a patient affected by uh, encephalitis and encephalopathy uh, showed about this uh, huge increase uh, in cases affected by delirium. We didn't observe a lot of difference in epilepsy and in many others, uh, uh, like tumor or metastasis. Now, uh, to, to show how stroke, uh, our ischemic stroke was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, increased uh, due to uh, COVID-19, uh, we made a, a sort of a, a analysis of all the cases we have from 2010 to 2019, and we compare on four different uh, uh, categories. So transient ischemic attack, hemorrhage stroke, uh, ischemic stroke, and epilepsy. As you can see here from the bars and from these lines, we didn't observe an increased number of uh, epileptics uh, at the emergency room, we didn't observe an increased number of hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic stroke, and we even didn't observe an increased number of transit ischemic attack. But as you can see here, uh, comparing the number of stroke patients during March and April uh, to comparing this number with our average number, uh, the difference is uh, pretty clear. So what are the specific features of COVID-19 related stroke? Uh, I told you that in some cases, stroke follows a COVID-19 uh, typical symptomatology. In some cases, uh, stroke precedes a, a COVID-19 symptomatology. Uh, we observe more or less in our case series that almost 20, 25% of patients uh, turned out to develop COVID-19 related symptoms afterwards, the onset of a neurological cerebrovascular vascular related uh, symptoms. Uh, but this is very heterogeneous. So some patients are hospitalized, then they get uh, worse because of the respiratory syndrome, they get admitted in uh, the ICU, and then eventually they develop stroke. But as you can see here, there are also some subjects that develop a stroke after uh, weeks from uh, hospitalization. And we have to take this into account. It is interesting how this paper from Merkler made uh, uh, this interesting uh, uh, study uh, by comparing the characteristics uh, among the COVID-19 population of those that develop a stroke from those who do, did not develop stroke. And as you can see here, uh, those uh, were carrying cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, no, no, this was not surprising, uh, but most of this uh, uh, required uh, an admission in ICU, intensive care. And look at the, the, the huge uh, increase of uh, the dimer levels uh, in this category. Even more interesting, as you can see here, there was a, 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 a huge increased number of cryptogenic stroke. When in, normally, when we uh, observe and we uh, investigate uh, what is the percentage of cryptogenic stroke in a normal population or stroke patient, actually 
it is around 5% or 10%, depending on the age. Now we have 52% of this series that didn't show uh, a reasonable risk factor for developing a stroke. And this is one thing that we have to take into account. Now, comparing COVID-19 with other pandemia or epidemia like flu-like epidemia, uh, they uh, made this interesting observation that uh, COVID-19, in fact, is much worse, is much worse than uh, the, the, the stroke related to, to the normal flu. We know that influenza is a, a risk factor for stroke, but uh, the, the risk uh, of developing a stroke during COVID-19 is much higher and uh, is uh, uh, related to inflammation and is related to the hypercoagulability uh, that is uh, signed by the D-dimer and uh, is related to much worse uh, prognosis and severity. Now, uh, one of the uh, conclusion of this paper uh, came out from this uh, 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 univariate and uh, uh, multivariate analysis. Patients affected by COVID-19 are more likely to have an acute uh, ischemic stroke than patient with influenza, as I, I told you before. But the association between COVID-19 and acute uh, ischemic stroke persists across multiple sensitivity analysis. So even adjusting for vascular risk factors or adjusting for vascular risk factors and ICU admission due to the respiratory syndrome. Uh, even adjusting for a virus syndrome symptoms uh, or uh, adjusting for the admission to the hospital. So there are uh, a strong evidence that uh, COVID-19 uh, impose a, a, a great burden uh, on uh, uh, acute stroke. Now, how is stroke uh, in COVID-19 different? Uh, we have, we observe, in fact, that a patient uh, affected by COVID-19 has a worse neurological admission and a worse uh, prognosis and in fact, uh, there is a high mortality rate. I would say a high lethality rate, uh, probably higher than 30%, uh, but the range of 10%, 30% according to different studies. Uh, another observation that uh, we will talk about eventually is the higher prevalence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, this data has not been confirmed in literature but has not been uh, searched for uh, in different series, so it's still there. Uh, we have the feeling that COVID-19 patient in some way have a higher risk to develop atrial fibrillation, and atrial fibrillation might in fact uh, be related to stroke. Now, when we talk about severity, uh, let me go back to this analysis uh, investigation that I did with my collaborators, uh, comparing uh, these different uh, categories, uh, uh, the historical cases with uh, uh, the sample that we collected uh, from uh, uh, February uh, through April. Now, so I can say here, uh, patients were uh, a little bit older, not very much, in fact, but a uh, number of uh, uh, death uh, was very high uh, from 6%, what is the average mean that we had, uh, up to uh, 12%. And there's a double risk of a double rate of lethality has been observed. If you compare uh, transitory ischemic attack, uh, hemorrhagic stroke uh, and epilepsy. There are many reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons that when we were uh, during this uh, first uh, outbreak, uh, we ran out of clean beds, uh, out of 1,000 beds that uh, the number of uh, the beds in this hospital, uh, at a certain point, we had 700 beds that were dedicated to COVID-19 patients. 
So uh, for clean patient, there was a, a sort of a difficulty to get into the hospital. So a lot of people uh, went in when they were very, very severely affected. Uh, one of the major problems that we face, and I think everybody faces all over the world, uh, no matter where we are, is the management of stroke patient. It means uh, how do we manage stroke uh, in time of COVID-19, independent of uh, stroke, uh, COVID-19 related stroke or not. Uh, this is one of the major problems because uh, uh, different papers uh, came uh, very soon out in the literature uh, by showing that there was, and this was observed in many countries, a, a sort of, uh, a, as you can see, a decrease of a stroke patient admitted to the uh, clean neurology. Uh, so patients had difficulty to reach uh, those hospitals uh, and uh, there was a, a sort of a, a decrease in endovascular treatments and thrombolysis, even if, even in COVID-19, there is no contraindication for endovascular treatment and thrombolysis. In fact, as the American Earth Association has uh, claimed uh, and uh, produced uh, a, an algorithm for uh, managing uh, not suspected COVID-19 uh, stroke patient and uh, uh, COVID-19 actually a confirmed stroke patient. And as you can see here, uh, there are some, uh, some, some levels around some, some issues uh, uh, that it would require a lot of time, but uh, we, we should not take uh, COVID-19 stroke-related as a, a major contraindication. Actually, we might uh, eventually treat them uh, in the same manner that we treat uh, not COVID-19 stroke patients. However, uh, we have to admit that in Italy, as well as in, in, in other country, um, we have to face uh, extreme measures uh, that have been taken to contain the spread of the disease, uh, including uh, the converting medical, uh, general medical wards to quarantine wards for patients, uh, to locking down uh, some of the communities, but locking down also hospitals, uh, and suspending routine outpatient clinics, uh, and stopping uh, most of uh, elective procedures. So uh, the normal neurological care across the world has been seriously uh, impaired. And many stroke centers in Lombardy, uh, in fact, were reduced in terms of beds. And we established a sort of a spoken up. It didn't work a lot, at least in the first uh, weeks. Uh, uh, and Brescia was one of the four hub for all the Lombardy. And uh, this might explain uh, why uh, uh, we had such an increase of patients during the outbreak. Uh, anyway, uh, the problem was not a problem for COVID-19 patients, but also for uh, not COVID-19 patients. But anyway, uh, one of the problems was to uh, time. Uh, to uh, contain the time uh, loss uh, for transportation from a spoke to a hub and uh, to uh, manage uh, a patient uh, suspect or confirmed of COVID-19 into an hospital uh, by uh, guaranteeing a fast track for the treatment. Uh, there are some challenges here. And uh, I, I take uh, that the paper of Hospital and Goyal, uh, because they made uh, all the points and the challenges related for endovascular treatment. Uh, some of the problem has to do with uh, uh, the COVID-19 screening tool and the patient triage and transport from one hospital to another hospital. And this was one of the major problems. Some patients were not treated and had problem for, because they had problem to, for reaching uh, the right place for the right treatment. Uh, there is a problem also for uh, taking the decision in patient with COVID-19, because at that time in emergency room, we have to establish 
a sort of an interdisciplinary uh, team for taking into account all the issues related, uh, even for intubation. Uh, even for the thrombectomy, thrombectomy procedures, uh, you know, you have to uh, have a sort of a double unit, a double uh, uh, physician, double nurses. So everything has to, in some way, uh, be double and very separated in order to guarantee clean on one side and the, the right management on the other side. And uh, at the end, uh, one of the problems also that we faced, uh, at least in the first weeks, was to, in some way, dismiss the patient uh, that uh, survived. Uh, and then uh, for a rehabilitation center, it took a lot of time. And there were not bad enough, uh, bags enough for uh, taking uh, care of all these uh, uh, dismissals. And this is something that uh, right now we, we, we can manage in, in a much proper way, but we had a lot of problem at that time. So all these things has to be accomplished in order to take care of uh, all the, the stages uh, that bring for uh, up to the treatment. Now, there are some straight strategy that we learn and that uh, have been uh, uh, proposed and promote. Uh, first of all, I think that the establishment of uh, stroke networks, uh, uh, differentiating levels uh, of uh, uh, therapeutic strategies uh, and uh, uh, establishment of a care system that uh, might be uh, my end to able to uh, deliver high quality emergency stroke care is particularly important during uh, crisis like the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the establishment of stro stroke networks means also uh, the development or the definition of what is a centralized stroke treatment center and to establish how many centers we need for uh, a sort of a catchment area. And this uh, is, is something important uh, because for a stroke treatment centers to be established and defined, you have to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, competences and skills. Uh, definitely uh, another problem that we were not uh, uh, prepared of was to deal with uh, such a disease like COVID-19. And I think that uh, improving education with health professionals and the public and let them know that uh, we can take care of them, that they don't have to be, uh, uh, don't be worry about uh, being a COVID hospital or having uh, such a, a crisis uh, that they can uh, get the, the, the treatment. Uh, this is something that um, we learned we have to, because we have the feeling that a lot of patients did not come to the hospital because they had fear to come to the hospital. But what was the reality of uh, uh, the management of stroke? Now, uh, there is a survey that different centers have, have, have been uh, performed. And uh, uh, so we investigated uh, with this consortium uh, how many uh, patients were admitted in the stroke centers and how many uh, endovascular treatment has been performed uh, in all the centers. And as, as you can see here, um, we, you, you cannot find the differences. There are some differences in some days, but uh, generally, globally, uh, we didn't uh, observe across Europe uh, a, a sort of a significant decrease in endovascular treatments. Uh, and this is one. Uh, another point that uh, the, the, the paper made it clear, this paper is in press, uh, has been accepted, but is still in press, is, is going to be in press, uh, is that we didn't show, in fact, uh, a, a decrease in the meantime. Actually, uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the transportation stroke constant to hospital admission, uh, in fact, decreased, uh, whereas at the time for admission uh, to the image or neuroimaging 
and eventually from uh, uh, imaging to the treatment initiation uh, did not change a lot. Uh, so uh, what we worried about, in fact, didn't happen. Uh, we treated a lot of patients, even affected by COVID-19. We maintain a good standard for uh, COVID-19 negative uh, stroke patient. And uh, this is something that we have to be proud of. Now, this is our experience. Uh, uh, All together, we had at the end of more than 170 stroke patients in the first two months. And as I told you, uh, we had a huge number of COVID-19 related stroke. Uh, there was no difference in age, there was no difference in gender, and no difference in uh, uh, cardiovascular problem, even if, uh, as you can see here, uh, hypertension uh, was more presented in uh, COVID-19 negative subjects uh, with stroke than in uh, COVID-19 positive. Uh, but on the other side, as you can see here, atrial fibrillation, as I told you before, uh, in our series was more represented, more frequent in COVID-19 subjects. And uh, again, uh, uh, probably uh, the, the, the fact that uh, in this subject, there was a, a sort of a history of previous uh, ischemic stroke seems to uh, underline that stroke in COVID-19 has not to do with the traditional risk factors, but is uh, closely related to the inflammatory and the thrombotic activation that COVID-19 imposes in, uh, in, in these patients. Now, looking at the blood samples uh, uh, and uh, the, the blood examination, uh, there is no uh, surprise because this has been observed in, in most COVID-19 subjects. Uh, there is a lymphocytopenia, so a decrease in lymphocytes, uh, an increase uh, in, uh, uh, in hepatic enzymes, uh, uh, in particular of uh, lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, there was a, a, a decrease of albumin and uh, a sort of a, a, an important inflammatory reaction that uh, is uh, uh, shown by the increase in C-reactive protein and in uh, the increase of fibrinogen. And uh, to, to be uh, noticed, uh, there was an increase in troponin levels uh, as uh, 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 demonstrating and uh, supporting the claim that COVID-19 patient, in fact, uh, because of inflammatory, the huge inflammatory reaction and uh, the hypercoagulable state uh, are at high risk for a stroke. Um, as you can see here, uh, stroke severity was uh, uh, higher in uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, again, uh, uh, hypertension was uh, more represented in COVID-19 negative. Uh, so stroke severity was one of the uh, surprising uh, uh, evidence. So uh, one of the most uh, uh, important things uh, to be noticed is that patient uh, affected by COVID-19, when they develop a stroke, uh, generally they develop a, a, a severe stroke. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we, we found uh, uh, as a cause of stroke, uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac embolism as one of the most important uh, uh, risk factors. And uh, this is, uh, argues for uh, the need of uh, be uh, tempestive, very, very uh, rapid in uh, identifying the subjects uh, for uh, revascularization therapy. Uh, as you can see here, there was no difference uh, in uh, reaching uh, IV thrombolysis or the vascular thrombectomy. More or less, uh, uh, in terms of percentage, uh, we were able to treat uh, COVID-19 positive and COVID-19 negative stroke patient at the same uh, rate. And uh, this is something that we have to underline. Even if uh, in our experience, uh, not in the European experience, we faced uh, an increase uh, uh, time from stroke onset to hospital admission, it didn't reach uh, uh, significance, 
but there, are, there is some differences uh, and even uh, from uh, uh, time from stroke concept to brain imaging, uh, as you can see here, almost closer to the significance. Uh, in fact, uh, as, uh, as uh, underlined by this uh, statement, the median time from stroke symptoms onset to femoral puncture was longer in COVID-19 positive group and so was also the median time for uh, the median time from femoral puncture to uh, recanalization. Now, what are the predictors of outcome? Uh, now we have to do a uh, change a little bit perspective because as I already told you, uh, these patients uh, have uh, two diseases at the same time, stroke on one side and COVID-19. And most of them are elderly and most of them are frail, and most of them uh, develop a delirium. And delirium is by itself uh, a sort of a risk factor. So we are facing a, a, a sort of a diabolic, uh, terrible uh, interplay of uh, different factors. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, I already told you, uh, COVID-19 stroke patient uh, where compared to non-COVID-19 stroke patient, a higher risk for serious complication and death. Uh, you can see the rate of lethality we observe in our series that is very similar to many other series. So we must uh, some way underline that this is a common uh, findings uh, that 30% of COVID-19 cerebrovascular patient died. And this number is a huge number compared to the 6% of non-COVID-19 stroke patient. Delirium, delirium was pretty high in uh, uh, COVID-19 patient also because uh, they were slightly older than non-COVID-19 subject uh, and fever was even uh, present uh, in a, 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 a certain amount of, of subject. So fever uh, and delirium were strictly related and both were some way predictive of uh, an increased mortality. Uh, when subjects survived, uh, what was our uh, uh, result of finding in terms of uh, severity. And uh, well, you have to take into account that uh, patients were admitted with an increase at NIH stroke scale uh, uh, score. And uh, at the dis discharge, they didn't improve a lot, uh, as not as much as non COVID 19 subjects. So uh, the modified ranking score measuring, uh, let's say, uh, the functional status uh, at the discharge was quite different. So uh, the burden that uh, having both disease, stroke and COVID-19 is pretty high in terms of death and is pretty high in terms of severity and of complication and severity of neurological symptoms. And uh, this is something uh, that we didn't expect to observe, but this is something that we observe. Now, when we compare non-survivor from uh, uh, to, no, to survivors, this was a, a preliminary analysis. Uh, as you can see here, non-survivor were uh, older than survivor stroke patient, and these are all COVID-19 stroke related. Uh, again, non-survivor compared to survivor COVID-19 stroke patient uh, had even a higher uh, NIH stroke uh, severity score. And they show a much more important uh, uh, QSOFA score. So uh, respiratory related uh, impairment. So not only stroke was uh, severe, but even the respiratory symptoms uh, uh, and the respiratory insuffic insufficiency was higher. So these two, uh, uh, let's say, diseases uh, uh, 
had an, a synergistic effect. Having COVID-19 increase the severity of stroke and having a stroke increase the severity of COVID-19 related symptomatology. Um, the only uh, factors uh, that we uh, observe by looking at blood analysis uh, was again the lactate dehydrogenase. It has been observed in different series. In fact, uh, this was one of the most sensitive and uh, uh, predictive factors for uh, mortality uh, among the cerebrovascular patients affected by COVID-19. When we put all together, uh, uh, the, the, what came out was on, the, on multinomial uh, logistic regression analysis, uh, including uh, the, the, severity uh, the severity score for stroke, age, uh, the, the, the pulmonary impairment, uh, and the uh, LDH levels, uh, we came out that age was the strongest uh, factor, the, uh, the pulmonary problem. So again, both uh, conditions uh, work together in increasing uh, lethality, even if uh, LDH seemed to be a good predictor for uh, a worse uh, uh, prognosis. Uh, now I'm, I'm ending up with uh, this issue that is frailty and multimorbidity. Uh, this is something that we want to look at uh, because uh, there is a, a strong evidence that in different series, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, frail people are at higher risk uh, for uh, a serious consequence, uh, even uh, mortality. And as you can see here, there is an age-related increase in mortality rate, but if we put together age and frailty, we might end up uh, finding that frailty is uh, even more important than age. And uh, frailty seems to be even more important than multimorbidity. This is a nice paper that Alessandra Marangoni uh, has uh, uh, recently uh, published, uh, um, and uh, she made uh, uh, this uh, interesting observation that frailty, even more than multimorbidity, seems to uh, uh, identify in a very uh, significant way those patients that uh, might have a poor prognosis. And uh, actually, uh, there is one paper uh, that uh, uh, came uh, uh, recently out on this issue. And I think this is a very interesting one. Uh, and it, it seems to underline that uh, frailty uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is an important factor, even more than age, even more than gender, even more than uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, risk factors. And uh, uh, it turned out that baseline stroke severity, the possibility to uh, guarantee thrombolysis uh, and frailty are the strongest uh, predictors for uh, poor prognosis or, or, or a better prognosis. And frailty, as you can see here, has a strong commitment also with uh, uh, the neurological severity in survivors. So I think frailty should uh, uh, be uh, evaluated and uh, should be used as a, a, a profiling factor for identifying those subjects at higher risk for serious complication uh, among stroke uh, COVID-19 related patients. So my conclusion are that both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke are a frequent complication of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, uh, these are, as uh, I show you, uh, more frequent than we expected and more frequent than other uh, varemias. Stroke might occur before the onset of COVID-19. We have to put this in, in mind and uh, to be aware that COVID-19 related symptoms might uh, complicate uh, the course of a uh, uh, stroke patient. And stroke represents the first manifestation of the infection in these patients. Stroke might also follow for weeks uh, a previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, and you might have thrombotic strokes 
after weeks or months, or hemorrhagic stroke. It is more rare, uh, really infrequent, but uh, in front of a patient with hemorrhagic, uh, look at the serological status because some of them might have had a COVID infection, even asymptomatic or partial asymptomatic several weeks before. Stroke is per se a risk factor for COVID-19 severity. And this has been shown in different uh, case series. Stroke patient, uh, when they develop a, a pulmonary problem, uh, they have uh, a, a sort of uh, a much higher severity of pulmonary consequences. Uh, COVID-19 related stroke patients are at higher risk for poor uh, prognosis, the higher lethality, even if we control for multimorbidity frailty. I'm saying that multimorbidity is an important predictive factor, frailty is an important, but when stroke and COVID-19 work together, they become even more important than frailty. And frailty, well, is, uh, is it becoming a sort of uh, a, a, a risk factors for COVID-19 stroke should be guaranteed the same treatments and, and cures of non-COVID-19 stroke. There is no reason for not treating COVID-19 stroke actually I think that COVID-19 stroke patient should be uh, acutely treated and recognized, and they need to be uh, treated in a, a much more convinced way. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Felipe, and thank you, everybody, for this kind invitation. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Padovani, for the great talk. It was wonderful. Uh, thank you to, for sharing your experience and uh, all your views about the COVID-19 infection and the stroke uh, in these patients. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of, um, the, our audience is very international. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, please send questions to our, through our Q&A uh, channel, and after the last talk, we are going to, uh, to answer these questions. So uh, thank you again, Professor Padovani, and uh, now we are going to, I, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor uh, Chris Bressani. Uh, she is a clinician specialized in internal medicine and a researcher at our uh, Oswaldo Cruz Foundation here, the Phil Cruz Institute. And so, please, uh, Chris. Hi. Hi, Chris. Can I start? Nice. Can I start? Yes. So, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon to all, or good evening to everyone else. Now, I, I would like to show you what I got learned about stroke and COVID-19 in the last month. And then what I still would like to know as a clinical epidemiologist. And eventually I would like to introduce you a Brazilian protocol on cerebrovascular events and SARS-CoV-2 infection. Well, I will share my, my slides. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, studies, uh, tens of observational studies were published in reporting on almost 300 acute stroke cases in patients with COVID-19. COVID so uh, here in this slide, uh, you can see these studies, a lot of studies. Uh, in most of them case reports and case series, but some cohorts and case controls were also published. Next, please. Uh, strokes are being frequently observed in patients with COVID-19, especially critically ill elderly and have been pragmatic 
pragmatic observation of many cases of ischemic stroke with distinct characters, such as large vessel occlusion, multiple site uh, infarction, uh, association with thrombus and embolism in other organs, as well as markers of inflammatory coagulopathy. Next, please. As is described in two reviews, which found frequency between one and a half. Uh, next, please. Which found frequency between no. Uh, okay. Thank you. Which found frequency between one and a half and six percent of stroke in patients with COVID-19. The larger of them. Descri described the 88 ischemic cases and eight hemorrhagic cases, and described the, the time between COVID and neurologic symptoms in a median time of 9.5 days, ranging from zero to 33 days, and that almost 12% of, of, of this case died. Next, please. In turn, some meta-analyses have been published, one of them uh, with data from uh, five studies found a frequency of stroke among patients with COVID-19 of 1.6. And another one show, uh, showed uh, a frequency of 1.1, 1 percent. Mm. Next, please. Uh, this this more recent meta analysis comprised studies with frequencies between uh, a half and five and six percent. Next, please, Luisa. No, I'm sorry. Return, please. And show a frequency of about two percent of an acute cerebrovascular disease among patients with COVID and uh, which, uh, previous please, and uh, higher frequency among patients with severe uh, COVID. Next, please. Some studies have shown that patients with previous history with, uh, with a previous history of cerebrovascular disease have more severe COVID-19. Next, please. In this study, a Chinese study with a big study population, the authors found that severe COVID-19 was more frequent among patients with a previous history of a stroke. But also, these patients had more vascular risk factors. Then, in a method analysis in a subsample by the propensity score method <clears throat> to adjust for these factors, death remained more frequent, and the composite outcome that or critical care was kept at two times more frequent among patients with cerebrovasculopathy. Next, please. In vice versa, uh, according to two uh, meta-analyses, one, according to two meta-analyses, cardiovascular disease is uh, more common in severe COVID. In this meta-analysis, the authors found, next please, Luisa. Uh, Please, return, please. 
found uh, odds ratio three of three, three times uh, a frequency three times higher of cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease among COVID uh, critical COVID patients. Next, please. And in these uh, other meta-analysis, authors found uh, a frequency two and a half times uh, higher, higher of cerebrovascular disease in severe or fatal COVID. Next, please. Next. Uh, we, we, we can say also that patients with a concurrent acute stroke present more severe COVID-19, as Dr. Pavan Padovani said before. Next. Uh, in these two studies, we can see that uh, we can see that acute stroke is more common in severe COVID versus non-severe. In this Chinese study with three centers and also in this uh, other Chinese study at a single center showing these numbers. Next, please. We can say also that uh, a stroke is more severe in patients with COVID-19. Next, please. Among 248 cases of stroke in this study of Qatar, uh, large vest occlusion and occlusion uh, and ischemia of a total anterior circulation were more frequent among patients with a stroke and a concurrent COVID. Uh, as well, uh, there, were, there was a worse clinical score of a stroke and a poor functional prognosis among patients with stroke and COVID. Large vessel occlusion was also more frequent observed among patients with stroke and COVID in six centers of New York, USA. Next, please. Next. Uh, stroke in COVID uh, is related uh, also with a uh, more frequent death. In this study from New York, uh, chance of death was uh, many times higher in patients with stroke in COVID versus stroke without the infection. And also in this study from Italy, uh, the clinical score uh, discharge and uh, poor functional prognosis were worse in patients with stroke and COVID versus non-COVID, as well as the frequency of death. Next, please. In a big study uh, from UK with 30 hostels, 13 hostels, uh, a stroke in COVID was more ischemic also, more frequently ischemic, was associated with, as uh, Dr. Pavan, the Padovan said before, with more, um, uh, higher mortality, uh, poor functional score, and higher uh, markers of 
inflammatory coagulopathy. And uh, COVID at, in, at onset of fatal stroke was present two times uh, higher than a non-fatal stroke. Next, please, Luisa. So I, what we still need to know is the cluster of stroke and COVID-19 due to the high force of the pandemic, which we had never seen before, particularly here in Brazil, uh, here where, uh, where we have many epidemic and endemic viruses other than respiratory viruses, or in fact, could the SARS-CoV-2 cause a stroke? Next, please. Only one study that Dr. Padavani presented to you uh, had compared a stroke uh, in COVID versus uh, admissions for influenza, for another uh, respiratory virus and found a chance of, for a stroke 4.6 higher than among patients admitted for influenza infection, adjusted for vascular risk factors and ICU admission. Next, please. But I question what about a uh, reverse causation or a two-way causal relationship? Well, in my opinion, we are still far to give a response about this last, this last question. So, as a early career researcher, I had imagined I study to investigate the epidemiological association between stroke and the SARS-CoV-2 infection here in Brazil, which was designed and is implementing with this big and experienced team. Next, please, Luisa. So, uh, our uh, research question, question is if will stroke events in Brazil and their severity be associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection? Please, next. And so the NeuroCOVID study is a multi-centric case control, including 11 neurology services with, with specialized care in stroke and eight accredited laboratories for SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis. Next, please, Luisa. The case will be patients admitted with an acute stroke and the controls patients admitted with other conditions. We have also uh, experimental objectives in a single center, in a sample from Restauração, Hospital da Restauração here in Pernambuco, to, uh, to run in vitro and ex vivo investigation to investigate immune inflammatory and thrombogenic profile, kinetics and cross-talk in stroke with any doubt SARS-CoV-2 infection. Next, please. Bom, it, uh, well, it was possible just by a network of neurology healthcare services mobilized by Dr. Lucia, Dr. Lucia Brito, as well as a framework of public laboratory of clinical analysis mobilized by me and Jurandi, that uh, a part of this study. Uh, to partner with the centers in each state where the study will be set. Next, please. So, 
thanks for uh, for each one collaborating with NeuroCovid study and attending this presentation. Thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for for presenting your uh, project. We are excited, waiting for uh, the answers that you would bring for us, uh, the insights uh, and this um, how how stroke emerges in patients with COVID nineteen. So it would be very interesting your project. And uh, so thank you very much. Let's um, go to the last speaker. Um, now we are going to uh, to see the talk of Professor Lucia Bito. Professor Lucia Brito, Brito is a neurologist, a clinician, and also researcher at the Hospital da Restauração and the uh, Fiocruz. And um, she's expert also in neuroinfectious disease. And it will be great to, to see and uh, to show you all her experience in uh, COVID-19 and uh, neurologic manifestations of COVID-19. So thank you, Professor uh, Lucia Brito. You can... Go ahead. Thank you, Filippi. And may I have my slides? First of all, I would like to thank the opportunity to share with uh, everybody these uh, slides and our work. And uh, good evening, good morning, and uh, wherever you are now and this, at this time. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, I think we have to focus on uh, some Brazilian studies uh, that uh, have been public publicated in, uh, in different neurological conditions related to COVID-19. But uh, we identify uh, a small number of uh, papers uh, related to cerebrovascular disease and covid and uh, I have this one that is the impact of COVID pandemic and stroke and sent in Latin America. This is a group of uh, Rio de Janeiro and they try to emphasize the complicated time this uh, during the pandemic and uh, comparing to the year before. And the other paper from Nascimento that the organization Never COVID Rio group uh, preliminary findings. Next, please. Next. Uh, but we know that there is a lot of uh, projects in Brazil. And one of them is a Brazilian University Hospital that is coordinated by uh, Felipe Ronglen and focus on acute neurological manifesta manifestation associated with the SARS-CoV virus. And also there is a, a, a group from Sao Paulo uh, that in conjunction with the other unities in Brazil, they are doing some uh, explan exploration of the, the acute neurological manifestation in COVID uh, run by Tropical Medicine Institute in, uh, in Sao Paulo and uh, Emilio Ribas Infectology Institute and uh, hospitals, uh, Albert Einstein and the General Hospital in Fortaleza. Next. Uh, we know that uh, this time is a continuous challenge for us to face the, the pandemic of SARS-CoV-2. And then as uh, Christiane said, we we propose the case control multicenter research in association with COVID, trying to, to focus on the occurrence, prognostic, and pathogenesis of the cerebrovascular disease and other neurological manifestation. And it was a rich, rich time because we have to motivate professionals to cooperate in this uh, proposal, and we identify around Brazil, some states that is prone to, to cooperate with us. And uh, also train the training, a specific training for professional and also implementation of product code. 
in every uh, state, in every center. So next, please. Uh, the second uh, proposal that we have is a sub uh, study that will be run in a hospital de restauração. It's a case control multicentric uh, that focuses on immunological and viral dynamic. Uh, and we create uh, a model to mimic a blood, blood brain barrier just to understand better the the immune mechanisms and try to identify the, the possibilities of neurotropism, neuroinvasion, and neuro virulence. And also develop a test to determine SARS CoV viral load that is very interesting for us to identify this. And the third one is a proposal that is coordinated by Liverpool, and we uh, we identify other neurological conditions. It is a prospective study that include Brazil, India, and Malawi. Next. This is just to, to show some, uh, some data from my ho hospital that I work. Hospital da Restauração is a public hospital. And there's a state reference for neurological and cerebrovascular diseases. And we got uh, some data from comparing 2019-2020 from August to October. And uh, in a clinical emergency, because we have three emergencies, uh, surgical, clinical, and pediatric. And in a clinical emergency, we have at least uh, in three months uh, 7,000 patients that we att was attended, and uh, among them, uh, neurological disorders are identified in 62% of the patients. And uh, in this group, we identify at least 70% of cases of uh, uh, stroke among these numbers. And in 2020, there is a, a mild increase numbers in the total uh, attendees in a clinical emergence and uh, uh, mild increase in neurological disorders representing 64% of the total numbers of uh, patients and uh, stroke we have uh, at least 19% uh, uh, of patients among 4,700 patients. Next. Uh, then, coordinated by Christiani and the other, the, the group that she shows in the last slide, we ident identify uh, 11 centers in Brazil in different states, two of them in Sao Paulo. And uh, we try to organize the neurological services and emergence uh, uh, for uh, attending these patients with uh, a be better quality. And uh, we have, as Christiane said, the support of the laboratory and also through the experiments we have uh, Instituto Ageu Magalhães in Recife, and also uh, Emilio Ribas in uh, Instituto in Pará. Next. Oh, sorry. Evandro Chagas. Emilio Ribas is in Sao Paulo. Then, next, please. Then we, together, we try to put in order our thoughts about how to build the, the CRF, uh, including general data, COVID data in details, uh, laboratory radiological exams, and also neurological examination and classification of the, the diagnosis that we have according to the WHO uh, classification and also ELU and the Collaborate, uh, and collaborate, 
translators from Liverpool. And the, we use the scales that, uh, as Padovani said, ranking and uh, NIH assess stroke and the stroke code. Next. The classification according to who, uh, as you, I think everyone knows, is a confirmed case based on uh, a clinical and uh, epidemiological data using PCR as a major uh, laboratory test. Next. And also probable cases, uh, suspected case that the vi virus test was not uh, conclusive or could not uh, be done for any reason. And a suspected case uh, where we try to emphasize some uh, contact or a person that was exposed to uh, the virus or in a re the, the, the local residence is uh, in a place that we identify many cases of COVID or someone that were required hospitalization in the absence of uh, any alternative explanation for other uh, disorder. Next. Uh, when we use the ELU uh, collaborate and collaborators classification for other neurological, neurological complications such as meningitis, encephalitis, myelitis, and cerebral uh, vasculitis, we also use the term confirmed when we have tests for uh, probable, when there is a test is positive and the, no other explanation for the, the, that condition. Next. But uh, in possible cases, when we have to, to have some supportive features, including uh, clinical and uh, uh, laboratory and radiological evidence of the infection. Next. We have to, to have in mind that uh, the post-infection disorders may occur and uh, acute disseminating cephalomyelitis, Guillain-Barre syndrome and other neuropathies could be uh, related to SARS-CoV infection. And then we use probable association uh, when there is no evidence of the other the virus involved, and also a possible association when there is no, uh, we have a, a disease and the, uh, the SARS-CoV RNA detected in any sample or uh, antibody is evident of SARS-CoV-2. Next. When we talk about stroke, there is the same uh, for a loo is the same uh, classification, probable association, when we have uh, uh, detected SARS-CoV in CSF and uh, uh, antibody in a serum, and no other known traditional cardiovascular risk factor. And probable association, either uh, SARS-CoV detected in CSF or other samples, we have uh, also, the evidence of antibody uh, indicating acute infection and other traditional cardiovascular risk factor. And the uh, next. Then we, we assume that uh, we have to, to join our force. And uh, Padovani said in your very brilliant paper, lifting the mask on neurolog neurological manifestation of COVID-19. Uh, he said that uh, the challenge is to understand the pathway that could underline each neurological symptom, the mechanism that lead to neurological manifestation, and how this manifestation correlate to clinical outcomes. 
And uh, we know that uh, we have to discuss uh, our challenge and we have to put every piece in a proper way to, to build or to progress in our scientific proposal. And uh, I would like to be thank to, to share our proposals with you and we have to discuss now, have time to discuss, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lucia. Very nice talk, uh, very inter interesting. And you have a, a big experience here with nerve infections disease. And at least for us, for Brazilians, we all have a lot to learn with you. Also, of course, with Professor um, Alexandru. And uh, now I'm going to open for the questions and answer section. So, the first was, I think, um, to uh, Professor Padovani. Uh, here, Dr. Phil Collins uh, asked it, so how has the use of anticoagulants had any effect in reducing stroke incidence in COVID patients? Well, you know that anticoagulants should be prescribed in patients COVID, uh, suffering COVID-19 uh, as much as they develop symptoms. So because there is a clear relationship between COVID-19 and uh, uh, the thrombotic uh, uh, increased risk. So we generally utilize uh, the double uh, fraxiparin or light heparin in these patients with special caution in uh, very old uh, and uh, patient already on uh, anti-aggregants. It, it depends on, but definitely, yes, uh, the answer is uh, anticoagulants uh, help in reducing the risk of stroke. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Lucia or yeah. Christine, do you have any May I add some comments? Yes, I think uh, Professor Padovani said the, the, the clinical uh, presentation of symptoms. And also, we have to focus on the, the results of the lab. When we have uh, uh, some prothrombotic uh, right. high levels of these this, uh, biomarkers, we have to be alert and introduce the, the anticoagulation. You're right. Right. Okay. So uh, next uh, question uh, from uh, ICON uh, from UK. Is there a scientific relationship between geriatrics so above 65 and COVID-19? Why? So I think it was a question. So uh, and then after, so why is that age group more prone to severe signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and mortality high? Here? Please. Is there an aging biochemical process that's implicated the pathogenesis of COVID-19 in stroke? Thank Dr. Icon. I think if you oh, can uh, like to answer. Yeah, please, so who would be would like to, to answer first? Oh, Professor Brito, Professor Padovani, Chris. Could you repeat? Uh, yes. Felipe, sorry. The sound was not so good. And then we lost a lot of uh, the yes. so, question. So the, the question is, is there a scientific relationship between geriatrics so above 65 years of age and the COVID-19? It's the, the first part of the question. And I think when we face, uh, when we consider the age of the patient, we know that uh, there is a, uh, some comorbidities that is became the the person or the the patient more prone to to develop some complications and then i think one of the the things that i i should answer is that there is a lot of co comorbidities that predispose to uh, stroke in, uh, in uh, an old patient 
do you think is there aging biochemical process that's implicated in pathogenesis of COVID-19 and stroke? Well, yeah, question. <laughs> I, well, there are some uh, some reasons for uh, being uh, elderly and having uh, such a let's say serious consequences. One is that the immune reaction to the COVID or to a virus infection is uh, less uh, efficient uh, uh, the older you are. So elderly, generally talking, uh, if they uh, are affected by multimorbidities, uh, uh, are less uh, uh, efficient in defending themselves from uh, virus. But this is also for bacteria. We know that even uh, urinary infection from uh, urinary bacterium made elderly patients at a higher risk to develop delirium, and delirium means uh, being uh, frail and be less resilient to all these aggressors. So I think that the mechanism has to do with the immune reaction and the inflammatory reaction. This is very unbalanced, so it's less immune defense and higher inflammatory uh, reaction, and this uh, explains most of uh, the serious consequences. Any other comments? Professor Vito, Bressani? Yes, I, I think we, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I think we uh, okay, have to think about the reverse causality uh, because the, the vascular tropism of the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, and so we don't know, and I, I think it will be hard to, to respond if uh, COVID-19 uh, cause vasculopathy or vasculopathy cause or predispose uh, to, to COVID-19 or both. And, and so I think we, we, it will be very hard to, to respond with the technology that we have nowadays. I don't know how, how, how this could be uh, addressed in, in the research. Oh, yeah. Because uh, if, if, we, if we compare historical uh, cohort, such, such Merkler deeds, we we have introduced bias in 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 the comparison, which we we cannot measure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the next question: uh, Did the patient who had stroke with COVID was post the COVID infection? or once they were infected that they had the, the stroke? I think it was answered by, by Professor yeah. Padovani. Yeah, Professor so, Padovani. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did these patients present previous stroke in the past? So they had a kind of a, a stroke or any vascular disease previously, and then after they have the, the infection, so they have another one, so the predisposition would be a history of a previous stroke or cardiovascular disease? Well, most of the literature data do not answer this question. This is an important question. <clears throat> Our personal series of patients seems to uh, stress out that most of uh, stroke complication in COVID-19 patients are actually due to the thrombotic effects due probably to the inflammatory reaction. So it's a new event, it's a new risk. And obviously, uh, if you are very old, if you carry uh, heavy cardiovascular risk factors, you are at high risk. But actually, when you compare these two population, those uh, stroke patients with COVID-19 
seems to have very, very low uh, risk factor, traditional risk factors. And history is true, right? Do you have any idea about the possible molecular me mechanism that could happen between the fusion and stroke? Was a little bit what uh, Professor Bessani was talking about. So any other mechanism, so a direct virus infection or uh, indirect uh, um, effect of the immune response against the virus. So we, have, we have a lot of theories. Uh, one that the virus enter the, the nervous system through the nose, other from the vagus nerve, other from the, the hematopoietic uh, way, so the, from, from the blood. And uh, so a lot of uh, uh, hypotheses how the, the virus would enter the central nervous system. So any, any, any comments about that? So what, what do you think about so it would, would it be effect direct effect of the virus, or it would be an indirect effect of, of the virus through the activated immune system. I'd like to, to add some comment in this question. When we, we think about uh, the mechanism of uh, that the virus invade uh, the central nervous system and the acute cases, we should think about uh, the direct infection of the central nervous system. But most of the, but it is a speculation. Most of the, the patient that present with uh, some sort of a neurological complication present uh, in acute or subacute phase, then we could uh, <clears throat> explain by uh, cytokine storm and also the, the, the action of the virus in, in the telio. And uh, during the inflammation, a liberation of such, such sort of cytokine that promote uh, prothrombotic uh, biomarkers, and then we said we have to speculate some, in some way to explain if there is a, a direct action or secondary to the the inflammation, but I think uh, Professor Padovani should explain better than me because they have experience. Well, there are uh, different issues here. Um, I'm not minimizing the possibility that the virus uh, can enter the brain or the CNS. Um, I think the only route that uh, have been demonstrated as a possible route is through the olfactory nerves. In fact, there, there are some uh, neuropathologists that after a brush of the mucosa, uh, have found uh, viral particles uh, into the mucosa, but also in the nerves uh, ending of the olfactory nerve. So it might be a, a route. Uh, the truth is that most of the study and most of the, the CSF studies we perform as well on many patients, uh, uh, they rule out to be negative for uh, looking at the virus with many different techniques. So it's really, really, Unprobable, unlikely, uh, a direct invasion. But uh, Lucia is very right about the cytokine storm. You know that CRS, so there is a cytokine related syndrome in uh, T cell uh, uh, therapies. Now, T cell therapies, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, is related to a neurological syndrome. This is very, very similar to what we observe in COVID-19. In fact, and this is the last thing I, I, I have to write down to say is that if you look at the, at the blood and you look at the CSF and you look about the cytokines, you find that interleukin-6 is represented even in the CSF, but more interleukin-8. Eight. eight actually is, it seems to drive most of the encephalopathic encephalitic syndromes. So, 
this is a story and Christian is right. We have to look, we have to develop new way to look all, all this pathway because there are so many pathways going on in so many different situations. It's really hard to understand exactly what is the, the, the major, the more important one. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are now uh, advancing our time. So uh, to close our sections, I would like to ask so Professor Bessani, any final comments, Professor Lucia and Professor Padovani okay. before we close this section. So I, I, uh, so I, I would like to go. Dr. Lucia. Go ahead, Professor Lucia. Uh -huh. I'd like to thank Professor Alessandro Padovani to accept the, our invitation to share his bright experience with us. And also uh, Cristiani Bersani on behalf of uh, Fiocruz team, as well as my group in uh, Hospital da Restauração. And also I'd like to address uh, a thank for the group that the WHO working group, the Global Health Network, Research Capacity Network and Brain Infection Global for supporting our activities. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my greetings for Philippe von Glenn that uh, was a chair for, from our session. And uh, thank the audience that accept our invitation and uh, contribute to our discussion. Uh, and uh, thank the speaker um, Alessandro and uh, Cristiani. Thanks so much and good night. Thank you, thank Dr. You Dr. Much, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Bressani. Thank you, Professor Parovani. Professor Brito. So you, we are closing the session. Thank you very much for the audience. And I hope see you soon. Bye. We have a vaccine, I hope. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the invitation. Thank you, Felipe. It was nice to meet all of you and to, and to share this experience. Great experience. Thank you, everybody.